I didn't realize how important this video is really gonna be until I laid everything out and saw just how many epoxy products there are and there are even more specialty products. Obviously I'm sponsored by Total Boat because I love their products, love working with them and there's quite a few, but everything I talk about with their stuff will apply, generally speaking, to other manufacturers. If you're invested in someone else's system, the rules kind of carry over. But if you're just getting into epoxy, which you probably are if you're watching this, highly recommend Total Boat. And then when you come at me with questions, if it's about Total Boat, I know how to answer it. If you ask me about other stuff, I just don't have the experience. So anyway, the nice thing is, at least for Total Boat, most uh, of your questions are gonna be answered just in the name. They're very intuitively named for their purpose, but that always isn't super clear. So what I'm gonna do is go step-by-step step each epoxy and use, use case when you'd wanna use each. We're going to mix up some of each so you can actually see a lot of the things I talk about instead of just blah coming at you this way because we have visual, so we're gonna use the visuals. There's a few baseline things I wanna cover before we get into each individual product that's going to apply to whatever resin you're mixing. So if we do this first, I think it'll make everything go better. First one of the things we're gonna talk about is mix ratios. This is a one to one, this is a two to one, meaning for every part of this, you'll use one part of this. For every two parts of this, you'll use one part of this. So you'll use twice as much of A as you will B, whereas here you're gonna use equal parts on the Total Boat cups, they make it really handy. They have all different kinds of mix ratios. Because depending on the epoxy, it might be a one to one, a two to one, a three to one, even though there's some five to ones. So you always need to be mindful of the mix ratio because if your ratio of hardener to resin is incorrect, it's not that it's going to just be slower or faster. It's the difference between cure and not cure. On that, if you're mixing really small batches, I highly recommend using a kitchen scale. I'm gonna use some metric because the numbers are easier. Let's say you're mixing a total of 10 grams of epoxy. If you're off one of them by a gram, you're off by 10%, which is way outside the allowable deviation of your ratios. Let's say you're mixing 100 grams or 1,000 grams. Well, now you're only off, if you're off by one gram on one of these, you're off by 1% or a tenth of a percent, which obviously is well within the deviation of ratio. So if you're using small amounts, use a kitchen scale. If you're mixing big amounts, you can use um, some pails and just try to eyeball it. That's generally my rule is anything under about eight ounces, I'll use a kitchen scale. If it's over eight ounces total volume, then I can normally just eyeball it. And I trust that I'm gonna be close enough just using the lines. On mixing, the way these work is all the molecules, you have to have, you know, hardener touching all the resin, resin touching all the hardener. This isn't gonna like flow on its own and come to its own nice homogenous state where all the molecules are touching each other nicely. If you don't mechanically get them there by stirring, they're not going to. So all of these you wanna stir three to five minutes. What I use and we'll overlay some footage is you'll see ribbons or lines, kind of stringies as these mix together. As long as you're seeing those ribbons in the epoxy, I don't care what the time is, you haven't mixed enough. Whether you're using a stick or I like to use a paddle mixer, mix until those ribbons are gone and then add your pigment. I don't add pigment until after I mixed because if you add your pigment earlier, is going to hide those ribbons and you won't have that nice guide to know, hey, everything's clear, I'm fully mixed now. So once I know it's clear, then I'll add it in. I know that I'm using a paddle mixer, depending on which epoxy you use. Um, some of them are more viscous or less viscous, which is like how close you are to water versus how close you are to honey. Um, and if they're thicker and you use a paddle mixer and you're going on a high speed, you're gonna whip a whole bunch of air and bubbles into it. And generally you don't want air and bubbles in your epoxy. So if you're using one of these, you wanna go slow speed. If you're using like the thick sets and the things that are closer to a water, it doesn't matter as much because they're really thin and that air is gonna work its way out really easily. But that is something to keep in mind. Same if you're using a stick, depending on how you stir it, it's really easy to whip air into something with a stick when you're mixing by hand. Last note on mixing. Um, like we talked about, everything has to be fully incorporated. It's really easy to have unincorporated bits of just resin or hardener stuck on the sides or bottom of the bucket. So a very good technique to make sure you don't botch your pour is once you're done mixing in your bucket, pour it into a pour bucket and then get rid of your mixing bucket. It doesn't exist anymore. That way everything in here you know is good because you're just gonna pour it. You're not gonna scrape anything out of your mixing bucket. Just gonna pour once it's done pouring, that's trash. So what you don't wanna do Say you're working on a pour and realize, oh, I didn't mix enough, I need just a little bit more. 
if you're using a pour bucket and you scrape, you know everything in here is good. But what might happen is you're just not thinking because you're in the heat of the moment, you know you've only got so much time to do, uh, epoxy's a little pricey, you don't want to you know, waste money so you didn't mix too much, you're like, oh, and I don't want to have to you know, do another mix and add more pigment and make sure I match the color, I'm just going to scrape it and it'll be fine. And you get a big chunk of unmixed resin or hardener that goes in your pour and then you have a spot that just never cures. And that's, that's a really sad, tragic thing to have to deal with. So to avoid that temptation, just use two buckets. Really simple solution. Make sure you mix three to five minutes. If you're using very small amounts, use a kitchen scale to measure it to make sure you nail your ratios. And always be mindful of what the ratios are and make sure you mix to the proper ratios because if you're not mixing the proper ratios, things, things just go bad. Anyway, let's talk about some products now. First product I want to talk about is penetrating epoxy. There isn't really a special rhyme or reason in the order I'm going through these, just uh, what I'm most comfortable with. I use penetrating epoxy a lot, as the name implies. It penetrates. This is a very viscous, very watery epoxy that seeps into wood very nicely. So if you have rotted, punky sections or something you need to firm up, this is the epoxy for that. I use this when I do a lot of slab work and on the edges, I need to reinforce those edges where the sap wood might have gotten soft, but we're trying to keep a live edge. Or if you had a knot where a branch was, it started kind of rotting and you got soft punky sections, but you don't want to have to chip it all out. That's where a penetrating epoxy comes to the rescue. It's very thin, it's two to one mix. You have about 20 minutes of working time. This is meant to be really thin and to soak into epoxy though. So if you mix very much in a cup, it's going to heat up pretty quick. So you need to get it out of that cup and spread. Once it's spread, you don't have to worry about it kicking off and going too crazy. But yeah, you have about 20 minutes to work with and it's, it's pretty intuitive. Don't try to use this as a glue or anything else. Now, the application says it takes like two days to full, full cure. The way I normally work with this is all slather it on the wood and as long as the wood is drinking it and I can see it soaking it down, I'll just keep putting more on until it stops soaking it. And then the next day I'll come back and do anything I'm gonna do on top of it, whether that's if I need to sand it because then I'm gonna go to a finish or if I'm just stabilizing before I do some knot hole fills or if I'm doing a river or something and I just need to stabilize the edge before I did a thick pour of another epoxy. Normally next day I'll come back and do that, no problem. Penetrating epoxy. Next up we have high performance. This is a two to one epoxy. This is sort of the uh, general all purpose epoxy from Total Boat. We have a variety of hardeners. We have a slow, medium and fast, which just give you different pot lives. And on the back of the labels as well as on the website, whenever you order, it'll give you the pot life for all of them. So if you want it to kick off pretty quick, use it fast. If you want more working time, especially if you're gonna like put it in a vacuum chamber to try to pull some of the bubbles out, you wanna use a slow to give you some more time. This is a thicker epoxy. So when you're stirring it or if you use a power drill, you're definitely gonna be working bubbles into it. So if you're doing anything where you want it fairly clear, you're gonna to wanna to put it into a vacuum chamber to pull as many bubbles out. One of the things to note on that is it grows a lot. So you only wanna fill your cup maybe 15 to 20% of the way through because it'll easily grow five times its size. Once you pull a vacuum and it really starts foaming and getting that air out. Um, a good way to cheat if you can get away without clear is if you're using any pigments. Pigments are really good at hiding air bubbles. So if you're going to do pigmented or have any mica in there, you can often get away without having to worry about the degas or you don't have to worry about degassing fully. So yeah, anywhere where you might be tempted to use a PVA or regular wood glue, that's where high performance comes in. Um, small knot filling, I'll, I'll do with this as well. If you're doing fiberglass work, this is where the stuff kind of shines. And if there's anything else I'm doing, I normally go to a specialty product. This is just kind of my uh, general purpose. I'm just trying to stick things together or I have small voids I'm trying to fill, fill up to maybe a quarter inch or if I want something done quickly and I have a fast hardener as an option, and I'll mix it with the fast hardener. And when would you wanna do this? A lot of times if I'm doing, say, knot filling work and I've got some knots that are within the size that high performance is gonna be good at, where it's um, you know quarter inch, maybe a few square inches, um, I can pour this in here and with the fast epoxy, if I do it in the morning, by the afternoon, I can be sanding it and moving on next day if I use the slow epoxy, but it might be too thin to use a thick set or, or something else. And then for 
general purpose stuff, if I'm using this just as a glue instead of wood glue, then just depends on what I'm gluing and how much time I think I need to have. I'm a little impatient, so I, I tend to like to lean towards the fast one I can. A lot of times I use the medium just as sort of a good general purpose, works all the way around if I need some more time. I'll use the slow and yeah, it's pretty much just like any other glue. It just bonds even stronger. And the nice thing about using a epoxy a lot of times is it is sort of the a great universal gl glue where if you're bringing two different mediums together, say, you know, metal to wood or fabric to wood or fabric to metal, whatever, it adheres to a lots of different things really well, better often than like PVA glue or something. So yeah. If you're just looking for a general purpose epoxy, nothing too specialized, high performance, two to one, it's a good way to go. Talking about high performance, I teased the thick set a little bit. So we're gonna go ahead and talk about thick set, which there are now two thick set products. Fathom is the brand new one. We'll get to that. So thick set, we have a three to one ratio. And for the Fathom, this is a two to one ratio. Now you're gonna use these where you do a, a, a deeper pour. So when you're doing river tables, if you have thick slabs, that had big knot holes, say you're talking, you know, half inch um, thick slabs or deeper and you've got a good volume, you need to fill these are the epoxies you're going to want to use. Why do you want to use this over another one? Well, because it has a deeper pour, basically. If you poured high performance, say three eighths, half an inch thick, it's going to kick off and go XO and just look horrible and nasty. It's going to yellow and crack and ugh. we'll show you what that looks like. I'm going to do, do it on purpose some so you can see what we're talking about when we say, oh, it kicked off, it went XO. These epoxies are set to go thicker so you can achieve that thickness in less pores, which means less time. With regular thick set, you're pretty much always safe doing up to about a half inch pour. So half inch pour is kind of the max. Let's say you have a one and a half inch thick slab. That would be three lifts of thick set. Whereas say you were doing high performance. I really don't like going over about an eighth of an inch if you're doing a, a good volume. So you'd be talking about 12 pours in that. So obviously that's why we go towards these. Also, they're a lot more watery, so they don't hold water. I almost never put this stuff in a vacuum chamber because when I pour it, all the air bubbles just release really naturally. I normally don't even come over with a heat gun and pop it unless it's the very last level because it just releases everything really well. Of course, um, doing large river tables, even having to do two or three pours or four pours, let's say you have a two inch thick slab, which isn't horribly uncommon, you know, this can get really tedious having to do that many pours. So total boat released just a few weeks ago, Fathom, which is good for up to a two inch pour if you're doing slabs. If you're doing small castings, you can go up to about three inches, but this just depends on volume. You can do three inches if you're doing a small area and you don't ever want to use more than about, if you're using more than a gallon, definitely don't go over three inches. If you're doing a three inch pour, a gallon is the maximum. If you're doing a big table, two inches all day long, that's the max because epoxy cures through an exothermic reaction. It generates heat. That's what makes it cure and get hard. But if that happens too quickly, which happens when you have more volume together, then it can get too hot. When it gets too hot, bad things happen. So if there's always this balancing act in epoxy of having enough that you generate enough heat for it to cure and cure in a timely manner, but not so much that the process kind of runs away and ruins the epoxy, which is one of the things to be mindful with using both of these is if you do a really thin pour, it's going to take forever to cure. You can do an eighth inch pour with thick set. I've done it to skim coat things and it'll take three or four days to fully cure because it just doesn't have the volume it needs to really come up to temperature and do its thing. As long as you're pouring at least a quarter inch thick, you're going to be pretty golden. If you're around three eighths to half inch, that's really optimum over half inch. It might run away with the fathom. Um, that's even more critical that you have a minimum pour. You need to use at least half a gallon of this, whatever your pour is. If you're using less than a half a gallon, you're just not going to have the volume needed. Or I would say if it's under half an inch, you need to make sure at least half an inch thick or half a gallon to have enough mass to get enough heat to make it cure or it's just never going to cure. These are not for, you know, doing your small gap fillings. This isn't tabletop epoxy for coating. This isn't your general purpose glue. These are for when you're doing those big pours and use the appropriate product. If you're doing, say, charcuterie boards and cutting boards, and most of those are half to three quarters of an inch, thick set all day long is probably going to be your, your golden boy for that. Whereas the Fathom, you're really on the bottom end of the thickness and volume for that. But if you're doing big river tables, 
Fathom's gonna be your golden boy on that because we can go up to two inches. So we're doing one pour instead of, you know, two, three, four pours. And that's kind of the difference here. And again, you don't have to do, worry about doing vacuum chamber and all that stuff. I really like these products. The, this and the penetrating epoxy, probably two of the products I use the most. Anyway, let's move on to the next. Next up, we have another duo, tabletop epoxy and maker epoxy. These are pretty similar, but different use cases, specially formulated for each, which is fairly intuitive in the name, or tabletop epoxy, as you'd think. When you go and you see, or if you have a table or a bar top, and you want to finish it with epoxy, so it's an epoxy cure top, use tabletop, as the name implies. When you see all the super cool epoxy art where people do the beaches and the waves or the cool clocks with the galaxies and all that kind of stuff, Maker Epoxy is formulated specially for that. These are both one-to-one -one and are fairly similar. Big difference you're gonna run into is working time and thickness. This is made to be very thin, so you can build those thin layers on top of each other and still cure well. You don't want to mix up more than you can use in about 20 minutes. This does technically have about a 60 minute working time, but really you want to limit yourself to what you can do in about 20 minutes. This flows very well, self levels well, very well. That's true of both of them. The big difference is just going to be your working time. You have more working time with your maker epoxy because when you're adding those pigments and you're trying to float everything out and get your designs and get your lacing and pushing it around, you're going to want more time. With your tabletop epoxy, you only have about a 10 minute working time before this stuff starts to gel, which when you're doing a tabletop, is fine, because all you're trying to do is pour this out, spread it to get a fairly level coat, and then let it level itself out. You're not gonna be fussing and messing with it. So tabletop is the way you wanna go for that. And also you tend to get larger volumes of this because this is made generally to be used in a larger volume, whereas when you're using Maker Poxy, you're probably gonna do an art, smaller things, so we have smaller volumes available. Both of these respond very well to heat guns, so you normally you don't, won't have to throw this stuff in a vacuum chamber. It releases air very well on its own. And because you're doing those thin pores, it's really easy to get your heat gun in there to remove any air bubbles that might be there. But you only want to do that about two to three times. If you keep chasing your epoxy with the heat gun, you're going to raise the temperature of it too quick. And do please avoid using a torch or flame that's just too much heat, too directed, too focused. You might get lucky and everything might work out. But if you're doing this a lot, or if it's just your first time, the best practice is use a heat gun. It's gentler heat. It's a lower temperature than a torch. And it's better distributed. And that'll pop all those air bubbles. But yeah, tabletop and maker epoxy, pretty similar. Biggest difference is your working time you have. Less working time for tabletop, more working time for maker epoxy. So just depending on what you want to do, it's pretty easy to buy the right one. One of Total Boat's newest products, just like the Fathom, these were released the same week. This is the Cast and Turn. This is actually not an epoxy resin. This is a urethane resin, meaning it has to go into a pressure pot to cure. These are for turners or anyone who casts things, but a lot of people who turn, when you have that really cool burl or you're doing you know, the Lego stuff and you want to put that into epoxy and then turn it and polish it and make a cool sphere, whatever your artistic vision is, this is the epoxy for that. Because it's a urethane, it compresses those air bubbles a little bit better than epoxy does, and you're able to get um, larger pores than you could with epoxy in the, uh, in the pressure pot. But yeah, another thing to note is this stuff is very, very moisture sensitive. So if you are casting wood in it, that wood has to be stabilized with something like cactus juice, before you put it into the pressure pot. If you just mix this up with raw wood that still has moisture in it, the moisture is gonna interact with the urethane resin and you're just gonna have a really hot mess that's very disappointing when you open it. So make sure you stabilize any wood before you use it. And yeah, another new specialty resin. Um, so if you're doing any casting projects, cast and turn. Next up, we have two epoxies, another kind of duo, even though not necessarily Fixo and four minute epoxy. Your four minute epoxy is like five minute epoxy, three minute epoxy. Basically you have, you know, two chambers of each. When you push it, it brings out an equal amount of both. Then you can mix that together. This is good for your quick little repair jobs. So anywhere you'd use any kind of five minute epoxy. Now the thing to remember is a four minute epoxy, it's not four, four minutes to fully cured. You have four minutes of working time. So after four minutes, things should be held together pretty well. You might want to leave it in clamps longer, but it still takes several hours to come to a full cure. So don't think you're going to slap this together in five minutes. You can start putting it under load or stress. 
but you know, this is the kind of stuff I use a lot for repairing the kids' toys or making little jigs or just when I have small repair work because it is really thick and easy to work with. Four minute epoxy. The other thing is thick sew. So when you're using larger volumes and you're trying to glue things together, this is a thickened epoxy paste. It has both components inside of it and then it has a mixing nozzle, which is one advantage over using this four minute epoxy. You have to mix this by hand. Whereas once you screw your mixing nozzle on here, it's got all these crazy little chambers that it comes out fully mixed, ready to go, kind of like a caulk. Of course, you do wanna make sure you use a heavy duty caulk gun with like an eight to one ratio, because it is pretty hard to push this. You know, the, the $3 caulk gun jobbies just might not quite cut it. So if you're gonna get this, make sure you have a good heavy duty caulk gun to go with it. Um, I had to do some boat repair. So I use this. A lot of places you might use a construction adhesive, like a polyurethane glue, and probably get away with using thick sew instead. One of the nice thing is, is it is waterproof, so anywhere water might be an issue, you can use it. And it also fully cures in like four hours, so it's a pretty quick curing process and the clamp time really isn't too bad. I just started using this um, recently and so far I really like it. But yeah, if you have any where that applying glue from a caulk gun like caulk would be handy and you need a super tight, strong bond, this is good stuff to go with. And the nice thing again is because it is an epoxy, we're talking great with multi-medium. So if you're gluing fiberglass to fiberglass, metal to fiberglass, metal to wood, fabric to fiberglass, whatever you got going on, it's great for mixed mediums. Last up, specialty epoxies. I'm not gonna go deep in the woods with these, but if you have a special use case where you're thinking, man, the epoxies you covered and talk about, I, I just don't feel like any of them are really optimized. There might be even further specialized epoxy. Here's one example, this is fixed wood. So anywhere that you might use wood putty or wood filler, you can use this, but it's epoxy based. So you have all the water resistance you get with epoxy. It mixes together. This is for non-structural repairs though. And then we also have um, flex epoxy. So this is a flexible epoxy. So if you have components that might be moving or stretching or, or coming apart in any way where there's gonna be a lot of load, which normally glue does not like if you have parts that are just gonna naturally be contracting and expanding against each other, that tends to break glue bonds. This is formulated just for that. Total Boat also has five to one, which is specially formulated for fiberglass. I don't do fiberglass work, so we don't have that here to um, demonstrate it. And I wanna say there's still several other even more specialized epoxy products. So don't ever be afraid to dig down if you're like, oh, what you cover it, I don't, I don't think that quite fits. There might be a product for you. And if you can't find it on the website, just feel free to reach out to a customer service and they'll be happy to pair you with what is gonna be best use case. If like me, your woodworker dabbles in metal work and some mixed media, then everything I covered is everything you're gonna need and probably a lot more. Um, if you're starting out, I'd say probably just the high performance is a good general purpose epoxy if you're using it as a glue. If you want to do any kind of pores, you're looking at thick set or thick set fathom. If you're working with a lot of slabs and you have punky material, a penetrating epoxy is something you want to throw into the mix too. If you want to do art, maker epoxy is made for art. If you like doing tabletop epoxy where you know you coat everything or I've seen like people do the stamps or guitar picks or pennies and then coat that in epoxy or bar top then tabletop epoxy is going to be your jam for that so most of the time it's pretty intuitive if you need something quick you know four minute epoxy or the thick so most of the time in the name kind of tells you exactly what you need it's not that daunting and all the information is on the label um, things to keep in mind are just going to be your Working time, purpose, mix ratios, and then following the good practice. Make sure you're wearing a respirator, make sure you have gloves because you want to keep this stuff off your body and off your clothes, that you're mixing thoroughly, use a second container so that you don't have to worry about unmixed bits. And then, you know, just, are you concerned with bubbles or not concerned with bubbles? If you're concerned with bubbles, go with a thinner epoxy like the thick sets, or put your stuff in a vacuum chamber to degas it, and then make sure you're coming back with a heat torch. So here what I'm gonna do is mix up some Total Boat Thick Set and some high performance so you can see the difference between a very thin epoxy and a much thicker epoxy. Then we're also gonna take the two to one, stick it in the vacuum chamber so you can see how much it grows whenever we vacuum it, as well as check this out. Speaking of specialized products, if there's an epoxy you use a lot, there are metered pumps available. This is actually adjustable for the ratio, but it's styled in for two to one. So whenever I use two to one medium, it's what I use the most, yeah, I over labeled it. This dispenses the perfect ratio of both for me. And here's how to use one of these ratioed cups. I'm doing a three to one, so under 
Here's my three part mix. I'm going to fill it up to the one that's under the three. And now we'll get my one part mix and also fill to the one under the one. Boom. Now if you look in there, you can kind of see Can you see the ribbons? Cool. I mixed up the thick set on the right first, and you can see how clear it already is, like no bubbles left to let go of all of them. And here's some two to one. I just finished mixing and how many bubbles are still in it, and it is struggling to let them go on its own. So we're gonna throw this in the vacuum chamber, see how much it grows. We have four ounces mixed, and if you watch on the edge, you might be able to see the bubbles slowly making their way to the surface. So when you do that thin eighth inch to quarter inch pour, especially if you're like eighth inch or under, um, you have a very good chance with a heat gun to get the bubbles out. But if you're gonna be doing quarter inch or maybe a little bit deeper, if you have small voids to fill, you'll probably want to throw this in a vacuum chamber to help get those bubbles out. If you're trying to do a clear, you have pig mix mixed in, that'll help hide any bubbles. We're up to the 14 ounce mark. It's almost doubled. Cool. After going through the vacuum chamber, you can now see the high performance is about as clear as the fix set. Got all that air out. But this thing is pretty toasty. One, because it's thicker than it needs to be, and just because it's thicker than it needs to be, and it's been in a vacuum. So if I was gonna pour this, I need to do it quick. It's gonna gel up pretty soon. Had lunch and came back. We've got about a half inch each, well, about a half inch of high performance, about three quarters of an inch thick set. I see the thick set is um, almost kind of sorta not really warm, still very watery. Let's let go of all its air, just has the dirt that was on my mixer when I mixed it. The two to one, this was more than twice the thickness it should be. See, it even melted the bottom. It's shrunk a bunch and pulled away from the edges. You can see it even kind of melted the plastic some and it's still toasty, toasty warm. Wanna call it, let me see if I can get this out of here so you can get a better, better look. This right here can happen with any epoxy when it kicks off. Um, if it's too thick. So whether that's penetrating, once I made a mistake and mixed up a bunch of penetrating instead of thick set, it didn't like it. That was really dramatic. But yeah, you can see it actually fused um, the bottom and how much heat it put off. Um, we have these like weird clear, not clear pockets where it got all yellow and it shrunk a bunch. It's all rounded off on the top where it shouldn't be. And also another lesson we talked about using that mixing bucket it's really sticky on the edges and the bottom. You feel from here how my glove's sticking to it because of those unmixed bits. So imagine if this was in a pour, that would be really bad. But yeah, and also that's super yellow. This should be clear. It's another thing that happens. I think I already said that though. So importance of pouring to the proper depth for whatever epoxy you're using and also making sure you do mix it well because this was mixed well. It's just the unmixed stuff on the sides that got scraped, but how we have these soft portions on the outside, if you don't mix well, that'll just be all throughout. You'll have weird squishy parts, whereas the top of this is actually cured. It's done. So just mix up some four minute epoxy. I'm sure you saw when it came out that there was like a, a blue and a clear. You can kind of see that in the tip. One component's blue, one side is clear. When you get it well mixed, it should be nice and cloudy. Another thing you can see is how thick this is. It's like a paste. So you don't have to worry about this like running. And again, I use this on whenever I need to do like small repairs and stuff. Um, another cool trick is mix on some tape. So obviously, you know, you need a mixing surface. I have some little silicone bowls I'll use sometimes, but a lot of times just lay out a little bit of tape, gives you somewhere to mix, and then you can just rip it up, throw it away. But yeah, that's what this stuff looks like. Nice and thick, obviously not very good for not filling or anything like this. This is uh, kind of like where you might want to use super glue, but you need a much stronger bond. So showing a difference in viscosity with high performance, thick set, and penetrating. Remember, high performance is a th much thicker epoxy. So you can see, as far as it goes, this actually is a fairly low viscosity um, 
epoxy. It's not crazy thick, but this is fairly thick. You can see how well it's really holding those bubbles. Here's the thick set. See how much smaller of a ribbon we have. Much, much more watery, and all the air kind of lets itself out even better. And then here's the penetrating, which is basically like water. I can't even really scoop it. It just runs right off. We've got a punky section on this white oak, so I'm going to use the penetrating epoxy on it. And you can see what I mean by soaking in or drinking it up. Just slather it on. Put some over here where it's pretty solid too. So where it was really punky, you can see now how the wood has drunk it up and I'll put some more here for comparison. See this as still wet. That's drank it up. So what I do is as long as it's drinking it, I'll just keep adding more until it stops drinking it. And this is why the penetrating epoxy is uh, so much less viscous, so much thinner, is obviously a thicker fluid is gonna have a harder time penetrating into the wood. So if you want a penetrating epoxy, it needs to be really thin so it can you know, work its way through all the cells and fibers and, and get down into the wood. And that's what this does. So just to better illustrate the difference in viscosity, I have a little board with what I believe is lowest to highest viscosity, so thinnest to thickest. We have penetrating epoxy, thick set, high performance, and tabletop. Um, so I'm just gonna put in a pigmented them so you can see them on the background here, and we'll just drizzle some on, and then we'll do a tip test so it runs. As you can see, this stuff, of course, is super watery, and it's starting to kick off because, remember, penetrating wants to be super thin, and I've got a little bucket here, so that's gonna get dramatic before long. Thick set, high performance, tabletop. All right, now we'll do a little tip. And you can also see, even just as I was dipping it, or maybe it's not as obvious on camera, but having worked with these, you can really kind of tell the difference. This is, the penetrating is very flat and so watery. The thick set likes to kind of fill its space. It's nice and watery though. High performance kind of sticks to itself pretty well. Whereas the tabletop with the self-leveling element, it likes to like kind of spread out and find a nice thickness about an eighth of an inch and it domes up more than the others. As we get thicker, we have it's taller and it domes up more. But yeah, we'll do a little tip and then you can see the difference in the speed and how everything runs. So it actually looks like the high performance is thicker than the tabletop. It's running a little bit slower. But you can see the thick set and penetrating, how much thinner they are. They're going really well, so yeah. Very unscientific, different amounts. I wasn't then like measure all these out. So of course the amount of mass that each of these has is gonna change how hard gravity's pulling on them, blah, blah, blah. But you know, kind of gives you an idea. You can see they're different. So no joke, I do hear that sometimes like, um, hey, is this is all the same stuff with different labels on it. Absolutely not. Each one of these epoxies is formulated for its specific purpose. I wasn't sure how long this was going to take. With the high performance, I showed you what it looks like after it does go XO. This is in the process of it. This is penetrating epoxy. It's kicking off some fumes, so we're going to go outside with this. Again, you can also see how this is getting all gummy and crazy. That's what happens when it kicks off. It hits a gel state and just goes nuts. Cast and turn. Going in the push pot. Just pulled this dude out of the pressure pot after about 30 minutes, and it is super duper clear. The only haziness is on the bottom for me constantly touching it. And of course, it didn't follow my own advice. Once again, another good demonstration. See all this uncured stuff that wasn't because it needed more time, that stuff that wasn't mixed well. So again, the importance of thoroughly mixing and why if you do a cast, you obviously are not gonna try to cast in whatever you're mixing in. But yeah, this is what happens if you scrape that unused stuff. So just use another bucket, mix in one, pour into another, then use that bucket. But yeah, here's the cast and clear urethane. Um, I wanna say after about 20 minutes, it should be fully cured in a pressure pot. I ended up leaving it in for 30 just because we were doing some other stuff with other epoxies. But yeah, this is uh, ready to chuck up and turn, which I don't have a lathe right now. But if you're a turner, um, cast and turn. Anyway, I hope you learned something, were inspired or at least entertained. And if you've been daunted about getting into epoxies or didn't know which one you needed to buy, I hope you now know that. And until next time, make time to make something.